All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the entire universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today I'm going to be reviewing James Clavell, King Rat. Um, now, this is the first James Clavell novel I have reviewed on the channel. Should have reviewed some of these sooner. I mean, he has written one of my top ten all-time favorite novels, which is Shogun. And um, James Clavell is also known for Taipan, Gia Jin, Noble House, and... Whirlwind. All six books, including King Rat, are known as his Asian saga. As you can see on the, um, you know, it says the Asian saga, with all of them listed here and what years that they take place in. <clears throat> and um, so we're uh, reviewing King Rat, which now all of these are standalone novels. They tie together slightly just with history and location, and some of the ancestors of this book might be distant ancestors might show up in some of the other books. You know what I'm saying. You don't need to read them in order. That's all I'm saying. And I'm not going to read them in order. In fact, King Rat is um, one, two, three, four, number four in order of the uh, five. Is there five or six of these motherfuckers? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six of the damn things. Okay. It's really all uh, uh, James Clavell ever wrote was the Asian saga. But they're massive books. And they were super popular and they made him billions and trillions and gazillions of dollars. So let's talk about King Rat specifically. Uh, came out in 1962. In fact, it might have been the first. But, well, no, I think Taipan was the first. I don't know. I should have researched that. I think Taipan was the first one. This one might have been the second one. Yeah, I think I'm correct on that. Wikipedia will let me know if I'm wrong, if any of you just Google. Anyway, okay. So it takes place in 1962. Let's talk about the cover design and everything like that, because you know I love graphic design and cover illustration. This is pretty all right. I mean, it's just got the barbed wire, because this is a prison camp novel, a World War II prison camp novel. Kind of reminiscent of The Bridge on the River Kwai. If you've ever seen that David Lean movie, The Bridge on the River Kwai, one of my favorite all-time movies. This book is very similar in um, theme and tone and just overall story. Uh, although there's no bridge that they're blowing up. But they are in a Japanese-occupied prison camp in China. So they're in China, Singapore, China. The Changi Prison, the Japanese occupy it. There's 8,000 inmates. Uh, most of these inmates are uh, British um, uh, or Australian or even New Zealanders. Uh, uh, World War II prisoners of war, um, army guys that just didn't, you know, you know, you know what prisoners. Well, there's only 28 Americans. So there's 28 Americans amongst these 8,000 inmates. Most of the inmates have been three years in this prison. And so it's rough. It's grim. It is um, not a good place to be. It's a work camp. They don't get a lot of food. They're mistreated by the prison guards. All of the above. <clears throat> Everything you can imagine about a World War II prison camp in China run by the Japanese during World War II. So... We start out with this, uh, this Australian um, captain, and his name is Lieutenant Gray. And man, he just has it out for the king. Or the king. Anyway, the character is simply known as the king. And he's this American. Um, the king, Lieutenant Gray, why would the, why would the uh, Australian lieutenant want to kill the king, this American? Well, because the king, well, he is American. He's cocky, he's tall, he's good-looking, he's muscular, he's well-fed, um, and he gets along with the prison guards, and he gets along with all the other inmates. Everybody seems to love him. It's just, why wouldn't you... When everybody is in a prison camp, starving and emaciated, and just gaunt and grim and miserable, 
But yet you've got this American guy walking around, still muscular, still well-fed, still just seeming to thrive and almost be happy with his situation. Well, of course you'd want to kill that guy. And this Australian guy does. And so the whole movie, the whole movie, <clears throat> I'll edit that out. The whole book is about the king and why he is the king. Why is he in such good spirits and good shape in this prison camp? Well, it's because he's decided to take control of the situation. He um, works cons. He's very um, narcissistic, uh, very confident, very cocky, works cons on all the other inmates, all the other guards, to get the things he wants. And he's kind of got some helpers. Then his, his uh, good friend Peter Marlowe is this uppity English military man from, you know how the English, you know, it's all about class society. Well, this guy was way up in the class society. He's kind of like this stuffy guy, but they, they sort of form this bond and friendship based off of courage and bravery and risk-taking um, and um, understanding human weakness and how to exploit it and uh, just how to survive in this brutally hopeless prison camp and there's a lot of resentment that's built up because uh, these guys are kind of just, they're, it doesn't seem like they're suffering when everybody else is suffering. And that's kind of the, the whole kind of theme of this story is um, <clears throat> when things are at their worst, how do, you, how do you handle it? How do you handle it? Are you going to be the king? Are you going to be, um, uh, are you going to be like Lieutenant Gray and just be jealous of the king? Um and this is kind of like, you know, uh, one of those situations where, you know, if you followed me for any length of time on this channel, you know, I work in law enforcement, specifically at the prison. I've been a prison guard and gang unit, mental health unit. I've uh, taught uh, life skill classes to inmates. I've done a lot of time in prison. And what the king is doing in this prison camp is still to this day not very unsimilar to what inmates do in prison now is they will become masters at understanding human weakness and how to exploit that and how to get what they want, how to manipulate other inmates and prison guards into getting themselves a better, more comfortable life whilst in prison. It's just nothing has changed. I imagine every prison and dungeon from the caveman days until now, has had this dynamic playing out inside of it in every one of them. Now, there's probably without exception. And um, it's just interesting to see how this guy in this grim prison camp behaves similarly to um, what goes on now in the prisons. And very interesting book. Um, I remember the first time that I read this... Uh, Oh, and what, why? And so then, then you're like, there's a couple reasons why this happens. One of the reasons is, is because, uh, well, yeah, why wouldn't you want to just uh, make the best of a situation? Why wallow in the misery if you can somehow get out of it? And you've got nothing but time to figure out your schemes. You've got nothing but time to come up with the most Machiavellian schemes to get what you want. And um, people can be pretty ingenious when they got nothing but time to figure shit out. Okay. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Oh, the first time I read this, I've only read this twice. The first time was a long time ago. I remember being pretty gripped by it. Like I, I remember comparing it to the bridge on the river Kwai a lot and things like that. Um, the second time I read it, I was looking at it through a different lens and that was a lens of, well, now I've had a lot of experience in prisons and, um, kind of comparing it to that aspect of my life, not necessarily the Bridge on the River Kwai movie, but the aspect of just prison stuff. And I found it fascinating in different ways. At the same time, I was kind of like um, less engaged with it this time than I was the first time. And I don't know why. Um, and I think it might have just been that I was more kind of like, I was kind of speed reading through this just because I was more excited to get to the another novel that was uh, on my list. Anyway, I, I imagine all of you have done that. Um, all of you have done that. You, you see another novel on the horizon and you're stuck in the middle of, uh, of uh, this one and you're just kind of like, 
I'd really kind of rather be reading that other thing right now. So I kind of, um, you know, I read pretty fast, but I read this one even extra fast. Anyway, I would give this, the first time I read it, way back in the day, I was it was gripping. I would have given it like a 9.5. The second time I've read it, I'm going to give it about a 7.5, um, just for reasons. And so there you go for King Rat, James Clavel.